Okay, this session is on space tourism and we're going to be asking, are we ready for liftoff? My name is Jenny Southern and I'm the editor, founder and CEO of Globe Trender, which is a travel trend forecasting agency and an online magazine dedicated to the future of travel. And I'm joined today by two amazing panelists. We have Michael R. Henderson, who is co-founder of Moon World Resorts and Mike Davies, who's the creative director of Priestman Good Design Agency. And we'll be hearing lots from them shortly, but I thought it would be interesting to talk briefly uh, about where space tourism is at right now. At, that, at this point in history, only about 600 people have ever been into space. And only a handful of these individuals have been space tourists. But could all that change? A number of private companies around the world are promising to make off-Earth travel available to hundreds, if not thousands, of people per year. After Richard Branson successfully went to the edge of space in summer 2021, Virgin Galactic hopes to finally push forward with commercial space flights costing $450,000 per person um, later this year hopefully. But so far, there have been no announcements yet as to when the next flights are going to be. Apparently, there are about 900 people on the waiting list. At the same time, after an equally successful ascent in the summer of 2021, Jeff Bezos's Blue Origin is now conducting technical assessments of its new Shepard rocket and says it hopes to proceed with taking paying customers off Earth again soon. Both Virgin Galactic and Blue Origin only have the technology to take tourists to the edge of space, but Elon Musk's SpaceX is planning to take tourists on trips around the moon. The company has already sold tickets to entrepreneur Dennis Tito, who is actually the world's first space tourist, um, and his wife. Um, he wants to go up again, he loved it so much. Um, and they've also sold tickets to Japanese fashion billionaire um, Yusaka Miyazawa. Um, I feel like they're very intrepid, bold people to be willing to go on a, a trip around the moon. Incredible if that happens. So we are on the cusp of a whole new era for travel. According to experts, the value of the global space tourism market is expected to reach 8.6 billion by 2030, expanding at a compound annual growth rate of 37%. But will it be commercially viable? Will it be safe enough Will there be enough appetite from the general public? So let's get some perspectives from our panelists here today. And I'd like to start with, with Michael. Please tell us about Moon World Resorts. Um, what is the concept? Thanks, Jenny. Um, Moon is really, the goal of Moon is to make space tourism available for the masses. So the challenge with space tourism is it's very expensive. It's a very niche market, a uh, little bit like the Concorde uh, in its day. Beautiful aircraft, stunningly successful uh, in the flight envelope, but generally not affordable to the masses. Space tourism, as you've just shared, um, incredibly exciting, uh, wonderful to watch those little snippets of uh, the folks going up but you're not able to participate, you're a spectator. And spectator sports are not necessarily the most exciting. Moon will actually be the bridge. Uh, we, will be, we will provide the ability for the masses to actually enjoy space tourism. So how are we gonna do that? Well, you mentioned 25 million to go to the moon, 500,000 for Virgin Galactic, uh, and so on. For $500, you're gonna be able to spend 90 minutes on an authentic lunar surface and explore a lunar colony. This is where the masses get involved. We can put two and a half million people on the lunar surface every year. So all of a sudden, um, it no longer is a spectator sport. It's something that you can actually enjoy. You can put it on your credit card. That's where you start to get mass tourism volume. Um, that's where you put Concorde against the 747 and um, maybe where the 747. Uh, Mike's gonna talk to you about the Concorde um, and you know, that's a niche market, um, but we're a mass market. And so in, in short, um, that's really what Moon is all about. It's about 
bringing the moon to Earth. It's not a theme park, it's very authentic. It's a very high-end brand, but you can all come uh, and enjoy it, as opposed to that one person way back there who's actually going to go to space. So, mass market. And so, obviously, we've got this incredible image behind us. Um, uh, when I first looked at that, I couldn't understand like how, where you walk. Like, what, do you walk on the top of that moon or what? Like, how does it work? So you want all the secrets? Yeah. <laughs> so um, it's the world's largest sphere. It's a true sphere uh, of which there are very few in the world. Every other sphere in the world could fit inside our lobby, just to give you an idea of scale. Um, if we build this in this region, it'll probably be about 1,000 feet uh, AGL. 305 meters, but what will make it dynamic is the diameter. It's a very big building, um, and it's as tall, it's as wide as it is tall. So that's why it, it's, it's quite dramatic. Um, if you imagine the sphere to be an orange, and we cut the orange in half, that surface that's left is 10 acres of what will be the lunar surface. When, you, when we get you up to that lunar surface, you'll be in an astronaut suit, uh, you'll be able to effectively walk and explore that uh, surface. Uh, there'll be a full authentic lunar colony there to explore. Um, I, I don't want to offend anybody, but there's no children, there's no ice cream, there's no popcorn. This is a very authentic um, feeling. We're working with a lot of astronauts uh, around the world and a lot of space agencies. So we're, we're trying to impress them and when we impress them, obviously, <coughs> then we'll impress you. Uh, so it's an adult oriented facility, of course. It's a destination resort. Of course, we have areas for kids and teens and, uh, and juniors, but that lunar surface is uh, critically authentic um, so that you will feel you're part of uh, the space race. You'll see um, technology that will be displayed by major corporations who are in the space uh, race. Um, and you're going to be really able to get a sense of what space tourism is all about, what space is all about, what... Um, we, we have a university campus on the surface, so a lot of science, a lot of technology. Um, the project is also very linked to the environment um, and how we're destroying planet Earth and what we need to do to fix that. So there's a lot of other components that go along with it. Um, but, yeah, I mean, essentially... I, and you will actually be able to walk on the outside, um, but you'll have to have a substantial harness. <laughs> so, and maybe a parachute. Uh, and but, what about the feeling of low gravity? How will you achieve that well, for people? Well, yeah, there's a lot of tricks we can do. There's a lot of tricks we can do. <laughs> yeah. um, I can't divulge them all, but um, there's a lot of tricks we can do to give you a slightly lighter weightlessness feeling. But at any one time, there'll be a thousand people on the lunar surface. So. We can't have you floating around in case we have to evacuate the place. Um, but yeah, you'll get a good sense. Touch, smell, feel, uh, temperature, um, uh, the, the actual surface of the, uh, of the moon. Everything will be incredibly authentic. You will feel um, as if you're literally walking on the moon's surface. It sounds absolutely extraordinary. And we're going to learn more about Moon World Resorts as this session continues. But I'd like to now go to, to Mike. Um, would you like to tell us a bit about the work you do at Priestman Good? Yeah, let me first introduce myself. I'm, I'm Mike Davies. I'm a Associate Creative Director at Priestman Good. Um, we, uh, I've been in the business for 16 years. Um, started in automotive design, but quickly went into industrial and experience design. Um, I've worked on many different projects over the years. Um, from consumer electronics to uh, high-end audio to um, uh, medical devices and patient care. So I've got a wide range of diverse experience that I use um, in my work at Priestman Good. Um, Priestman Good is considered to be uh, the world's, well, one of the world's leading transport design agencies. Um, we've been involved in some of the milestone projects in the uh, aircraft industry, such as the first interior for the Airbus A380. Um, we, you may know some of our products. Um, we work with Qatar Airways. We did the um, award-winning uh, Q Suite, business class seat. Um, and we've done some iconic work for Transport for London. And more recently released was the, um, was the first class suites for Lufthansa. Um, we work in aviation, rail, transport, um, public spaces and interior spaces and products. Uh, we work across all sectors. 
Um, and today I'd like to share with you a project that we've been working on, which is about space tourism, about this, this, uh, this subject. And I'm going to play the video for you. Attention all, we're proceeding with clearance to launch pole. That looks absolutely stunning. What is that? Tell us about it. So yeah, this is a this is the worldview experience, um, and that video was made by our in-house um, animation team. We've got a we're about seventy people, and uh, we have all the uh, multidisciplinary uh, aspects of design under one roof. Um, yeah. So it's called Worldview Experience. They're a client of yours, and this is something we're going to learn more about as the session continues. But essentially, it's a, a stratospheric balloon flight that takes you up. It is indeed. Yeah, it's a, the edge of kind of the well below the it's the stratosphere, right? It's the right? stratosphere. So it's about 100,000, 100, 105,000 feet okay. up in the air, and it's where you will uh, see the curvature of the Earth. And um, yeah, and the experience starts at the uh, spaceport. Yeah. So the spaceports, um, this is another aspect of uh, the experience that we've designed, but the spaceports are set around the seven wonders of the world. Those being the Great Barrier Reef, the um, Great Wall of China, the Serengeti, um, the Amazonia, Brazil, um, the, uh, and, and again, the, the, I've forgotten a few, but the spaceport Grand Canyon as we envision here. Wow, it looks absolutely amazing. So you'll be able to float up above these incredible wonders of the world for a, spend a few hours up there, looking down, having a glass of champagne. So the journey takes around six to eight hours. Yeah. Um, so it's, it's a slow paced journey. And I think this, this project is about um, taking the time to appreciate the experience. It's not an experience that can be rushed. Um, so when, when passengers and guests uh, take part in the um, experience, they turn up to the spaceport and they're there for a five day window. The reason why we need five days is, is to optimize the uh, flight um, window and uh, weather conditions because we want passengers to get the best view and we want them to um, have the most comfortable ride into the stratosphere. And the other reason why we want passengers to stay and guests to stay for five days is because we want they're in one of the seven wonders of the world. We want them to really enjoy and um, experience the surroundings that they're in. Because uh, we want them to experience this on a human scale. So for example, if you're staying in the Grand uh, Canyon Resort, um, we would like them to take a hike up to the Great Barrier, uh, to the, sorry, the, um, the rim of the canyon and really take in that massive um, expanse of landscape on a human scale, knowing that in a few days time, they're going to be taking a ride and, and seeing it in a very different way. Incredible. Right, I'm going to go back to, to Michael and ask him a bit more about Moonworld Resorts. Now, what inspired you to come up with this outlandish vision and will it ever become a reality? 
So one of my uh, favorite architects in the world, actually my favorite architect, uh, was uh, the late Richard Rogers. Um, some of you may know the Palmetto Center, uh, Lloyd's of London, which is my favorite building. Um, my too. And I often remember going to see Richard many years ago. And my partner and I, we rolled out this uh, visual of Moon. And he looked at it, didn't say anything, and um, just maybe spent a minute to think, felt like two hours. Uh, and he said, um, your project is a paperclip. And we both looked at each other and thought, is that a compliment? <laughs> is that the, an insult? <laughs> Um, and then he paused for a second and he said, yes, it's like the paperclip. It's so obvious. It has to be done. And so then it sort of made a lot of sense to us. And our original thoughts were to try to do something very spectacular and different in the destination resort field. We also needed to have a brand because to build a brand in any business takes a lot of money and a lot of time. And you may not necessarily end up with a particularly good brand or a well-known brand or an interesting brand. We didn't have the time uh, to do that, so we had to try to figure out how we could do something unique and different with a solid brand behind it. We now have the biggest brand in the world. All other brands combined, doesn't matter if it's Google or Mercedes or Yahoo or whatever it is, none of them can get anywhere close to our brand. Eight billion people know our brand. Think about that. Eight billion people know our brand. We have the biggest billboard in the world. It's free. Uh, we don't even pay uh, electric when it's lit. So branding was really important to us. But it was, it, it, you know, the, I can't give too much away because it's a book and a movie. You'll love the movie. <laughs> but the movie goes into a motion picture, um, goes into the exact detail of where Moon actually came from. But essentially, Richard nailed it. it it's so obvious. Um, everybody loves the moon. Uh, everybody would love to go to the moon. But it's very expensive, and some people are maybe a little concerned that you would be on a one-way trip. Um, when you come to the moon, uh, it's not expensive, and you can also go home. <laughs> so, um, so yeah, it's it's been an interesting uh, it's been an interesting ride. So essentially, we're bringing the moon to Earth. Um, in a very spectacular fashion, um, and everybody will be able to uh, partake. So what is the timeline you're working on? You know, when might we see the first Moon World Resort actually open? So pre-development will take 12 months, uh, build-out will take 48 months, so it's approximately four to five year build-out. That's typical for a large-scale project. Um, some countries can do it a little bit quicker, but there's a lot of technology inside the actual project itself. So concrete, steel, glass, carbon fiber composite, it's a big jigsaw puzzle, it's five and a half million square feet, it's a big project, but essentially it will come together fairly quickly. Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a highly complex project, but it's not as difficult to build as the Burj Khalifa. So um, it'll come together, it's the kit out of the interior that is uh, challenging. Uh, that will take some time. We have 4,000 five-star suites uh, in our central core hotel. We also have a boutique hotel, which will have about 150 to 200 rooms. Um, so, you know, that, the kit out of the interior will take some time, but we can, we can have it ready in start to finish five years. Right now we're in um, the regional licensing uh, mode. Um, we want to license four around the world, one in North America, which will be USA, one in Europe, which will be Southern Spain, one in the Asia, Asia region, which would be China, Japan, or South Korea, one in the MENA region, which will be Saudi, KSA, or Qatar, or UAE, um, uh, I should say. So um, there'll only be four in the world, which means that at two and a half million people a year each, we can put 10 million people on the lunar surface each year. That starts to give you an idea about what mass space tourism is all about. Um, with very great respect to Mike and the fabulous video who he's just shown, all of those type of projects that are happening, including uh, Virgin and Blue Origin, all of them combined will, will take a few hundred people a year. 
it'll be incredible. That will be amazing. I will go on that, but there'll be, it's the numbers are small. Um, so that's, that's kind of the mass volume we're talking about. Each moon project will welcome 10 million people a year. Uh, so 40 million people a year being exposed to space. Um, you can start to understand why we are the bridge to take people who have an interest in space but can't dash out half a million to get there. We're the bridge to get them all there. So with Inside Moon, Moon will be world central for uh, all space conferences, space whatever, space whatever will be all Inside Moon. But all of the space companies will actually have a facility Inside Moon as well. And so when you're at Moon, you'll be able to go and see what um, Mike is, is proposing. And of course, buy a ticket as well, uh, if you want. So it, it's that the bridge element is, is really important. Yeah, that's really, really interesting. I think obviously the main uh, hindrance to space tourism taking off is, is price. I think one of, that's probably one of the number one things, putting people off or restricting it. Um, so, so we've heard how Moon World Resorts is for the masses. Um, with Worldview, um, what kind of price are we talking about for this kind of balloon flight up to the stratosphere? So the price is set, um, sorry, Worldview set the price at 50,000 a ticket, which 50, is a considerable amount of money, but it's not so much money that we imagine that people won't take this ride. There'll be a lot of people who are willing to take this ride and people, um, I mean, we're taking deposits at the moment. So um, I think that this, this experience offers something very different to what Michael's experience is offering, yeah. for example. It's offering a chance to, to um, move up to the stratosphere and to see the world in a very different way um, to what you're used to seeing it. And only a handful of sm you know, a small amount of people have ever seen the world in this way. Um, and it's doing it in a much more accessible way than, um, for example, how I first imagined going to space would be in a, in a fuel powered rocket, for example, pulling six Gs. This is doing it in a very gentle manner. Um, so it means that it's more accessible for a lot, a broader range of people. Um, you don't have to be of any physical ability to use this uh, flight uh, experience. Uh, if you can take an internal flight uh, in the world at the moment, then you will most likely be able to take this flight. Um, and we've made the experience accessible for, for as many people as possible. And it's, some, it's a core value at PG is accessibility and inclusivity. So the, the design of the capsule, the boarding experience and the spaceport can all accommodate a um, aircraft issue wheelchair. Um, and I think Making this uh, open to a broader group of people just means more people will take this experience. And it's just, uh, yeah, it's... So you don't need to go through any sort of special training to get on board and kind of prepare yourself. You can, like a hot air balloon, pretty much, you could just there's, there's climb out in and, and you're off you go. Exactly that, yeah. Yeah, yeah that's fantastic. Um, and yeah, what else should people consider, um, you know, when... If the, when it comes to this as a future sort of travel experience, what kind of, what can passengers expect to kind of see? You've talked about like looking down, obviously at those wonders of the world, but what about like looking up? Well, actually, um, <clears throat> the space, the uh, capsule has uh, panoramic windows all around it. There's a space port just above uh, where you sit. Uh, so you can see the balloon, you can see the balloon inflate. You can see here, the balloon is at a certain size now, but as it rises up through the atmosphere, um, above the atmosphere, the balloon changes size, it, it kind of expands massively. Um, and I think the biggest takeaway from this experience for passengers is, is getting above the clouds and starting to see the world in the way that astronauts have seen the world. And astronauts have uh, long talked about the effect that that has had on them. And this is something that we want to, this is something that this experience provides for people. Um, astronauts talk about seeing the world in this way firsthand. And when they come back to Earth, they have this overwhelming feeling of awe and inspiration and connection to humanity. Um, and this is something that I think people are looking for. They're looking for that next experience. Uh, it's something that astronauts call the overview effect. Um, so um, the overview effect really has driven the interior design of the capsule. 
So you've got those amazing windows and you can look through this porthole in, in the top and can you see the stars through that? Like At some point you will be yeah. able to see the stars. I'll get to that um, in one of these slides, but essentially the experience is driven around um, having an uninterrupted view of the world. And the reason for the spaceports being set at each different uh, seventh wonder of the world is that you have that fresh um, memory of experiencing the, the, uh, at ground level one of these incredible venues and, and parts of the world. And then when you take this ride, you slowly rise above it and you start to see the uh, seventh wonder of the world that you're at become smaller and smaller and more textural. And I think it's at this point then you see the contrast, of the, the darkness of space, the blue horizon line, the curvature of the earth and the fragility of an organic nature of the world. And it really amplifies that overview effect. Um, and yeah. it's something we think will, will change uh, the way passengers uh, and guests um, live the rest of their lives. So it's a really, I imagine, prof quite a profound experience potentially for people. I think rising up at that gentle pace is almost like a spiritual meditative experience. It's to, at a real slow pace, it's traveling at around nine to 12 miles an hour. Um, and the ascent takes around two hours. Um, and then until you finally reach the wow. uh, high altitude of uh, 100,000, 100, 105,000 feet. And it's at this point, you will be able to see the stars um, because you're above 99% of the world's atmosphere. But because of the time of day that this is set at, <laughs> the sunlight will, will cause uh, a, a reflection on the world's atmosphere and you won't quite see it with the naked eye. But we, on board, we provided a telescope so you can see the stars much more clearly than you'd ever would uh, on, uh, on Earth. Yeah, I mean, it looks absolutely stunning. I, I think I'd be a little nervous to do it, but I think it would be worth it. Yeah, I think, uh, 100%. Yeah. What do you think? You said you'd, you'd get a ticket for this? I'm in. You're in? I'm in. <laughs> now tell us more about what the hotel experience is going to be like in your Moon World uh, Resort complex. Yeah, so Forgive the pun, but the, 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 the whole project is basically, if you can imagine it, as two spheres. One we've talked about, which obviously is, is the natural go-to uh, being the space element. The rest of the project uh, is a very large, fully integrated destination resort. All of the component parts, most of them you would recognize, hotel being one, spa wellness center, event center, convention center, and so on. All of these component names you will know, but you will not recognize any of them when you actually go inside because they're all very different. So our convention center will not look like this. Our event center will not look like anything you've seen. So they're all very leading edge component parts that actually come together to make up the project. But essentially our hotel, there's two different hotels. Um, one would be uh, 150 room, um, and these are ex exterior operated, so for instance, a Four Seasons, um, but it'll not look like any other Four Seasons. It will operate to a five diamond standard, um, but that would be a, a, an example of the, the boutique uh, restaurant. That will be on the outside, so those will be, uh, each, each suite will have its own swimming pool, uh, deck, uh, open to the world um, sort of uh, feeling. The interior hotel, it's 4,000 five-star suites, but there are no windows. Uh, all the windows are electronic. Um, so you can basically visual anything you want. Uh, you can take a photograph of your dog at home. When you walk into the room, you touch your phone and there's the dog. Um, you can obviously look at the lunar surface. You can look at anything in the world you want, uh, day, night, uh, any type of weather condition. And it's not a little screen, it's a full wall system. Uh, these are some of the ideas we had many years ago, but the technology was not available. If you wanted a full wall system, you had to buy 20 TVs and join <laughs> them all together. Today, you don't have to do that. So, um, but lots of very interesting technological components within it. Um, Moon will be a showcase for all technology. Um, so major corporations around the world will want to have their um, product placement um, and show you know, we'll have the official watch and the official car and so on of, of Moon. 
But yeah, everything will be different, fully integrated. You don't have to leave. Uh, you can arrive at Moon and two weeks later, you can leave and still not have seen everything. Um, yeah, that's the fully integrated component. And of course, we have, we'll have the world's largest uh, uh, infinity pool, and it goes on and on and on. Uh, but yeah, pretty, some pretty cool stuff. Um, tell us about the uh, partnerships that you hope to have with the space agencies you mentioned, such as NASA yeah. and Virgin Galactic and things like that. Yeah, no, that's good. Well, the, the space tourism uh, groups will obviously use Moon as a, as a selling platform. So all of what Mike has shown you, um, they will have a facility inside Moon and you'll be able to see it up close and, and book your trip, of course. Hopefully their um, spaceport will not be too far away from some of the locations that we are putting together. Um, the actual and Virgin and Blue Origin and, and many others uh, that are doing similar things, you'll be able to see those as well. Um, the, the actual global space agencies, uh, Canadian Space Agency, NASA, JAXA, uh, European Space Agency, they will all be able to use our lunar surface as a training platform. Um, so when you're actually walking on the lunar surface, when I said it's a fully authentic experience, uh, it will also be a training area for these agencies. So it, it, it's, an act, it's an active lunar surface. So when you see the people walking around um, doing stuff, it, it's real stuff. Um, they're, not, they're not actors. Um, and then when we, when we clear the guest experience each night to do our reset, um, those hours are used also for uh, space training that uh, those agencies don't necessarily want you to see um, because maybe it's, they're, they're, they're still working on something. Um, so yeah, it, it's a training platform um, for, uh, we can even say UAE now, uh, UAE uh, astronauts which is amazing. Um, so yeah, it'll be, um, it'll be nice to see all the agencies and we're, we have to build it for those agencies and that's what gives us the authenticity. So mm -hmm. in other words, if they're using it for astronaut training, you, you can be sure that it's gonna impress those of us who are not astronauts. Right, yeah, absolutely. And so when you mentioned that there's also going to be an active lunar colony, what's that all about? So the lunar colony basically will be um, what uh, is developed on the actual lunar surface in the not too distant future. There's a lot of plans already in place and within everybody's lifetime, um, uh, humans will have a permanent presence on the moon. And I don't mean a tent, I mean this will be a proper colony. Um, moon is not very far away, it's relatively easy to get to. Um, relatively inexpensive to get to uh, and so there'll be a lot of population starting to happen fairly quickly and you'll be able to see where, where they will be living in a real-time environment um, and we have lots of designs um, for the uh, for the colony and it's pretty wow um, it's really like pretty wow uh, it's cool because you see it in the movies you see it in Hollywood and you know we see it in Hollywood we have Hollywood people work with us uh, but this is not Hollywood, this is real, um, which is kind of cool. So it'll be, uh, yeah, it'll be an authentic experience. But you'll actually be able to go inside. Uh, if you can imagine Boeing, uh, Airbus, Lockheed Martin, um, you know, all of these major international companies, you'll be able to go inside their facility and see what they're working on. A lot of educational um, aspect to it as well, yeah. uh, which will be nice. But much different from going to, you know, uh, a museum or a you know a Smithsonian um, which is showing you what has happened moon is really showing you what's coming Wow, uh, I love that in in real time thank you so much now I want to go back to Mike and ask more about the the design of the actual capsule now obviously you've worked um, as a company on on you know aircraft interiors and trains what were the some of the sort of unique considerations you had to take into um, yeah, factor in when it, when it came to designing this capsule. So when designing any um, aerospace product or interior, weight is always a massive concern. And this is no exception. This is 
uh, this is emphasized in this, this project, we need to keep weight down to a minimum uh, for, for many reasons. And w one is efficiency. Um, <clears throat> but I think when, you, when you're keeping weight down in a seat, it's kind of counter, counter, it can be counterintuitive to the comfort of the seat. And considering this is a journey that's going to last six to eight hours, we need to ensure that we find this optimum balance of weight saving and comfort. So the seat is designed in uh, using uh, all of our experience from creating um, seat geometry that really hugs the, the, the form of um, the body and supports, but also keeping weight down to a minimum. So the foams are thin and low density. And <clears throat> it's using our experience from all the products that we've designed in the past in the air industry to really, to really optimize this. Um, We've avoided using a heavy seat mechanism because uh, lots of the aircraft seats you see today are incredibly heavy, uh, but they provide a lie flat bed and a, a lot of comfort. But this is, we've, we've opted for more of a weight sensitive approach to achieving the back angle, uh, the backrest angles. Um, and you can see on the side of the seat here, there's a small um, stowage bag, which is designed to allow passengers to bring their personal items on board, but we need to control how much they bring on board. Um, part, of, part of the experience is being able to get up and socialize with the other passengers on the ride. This is a, for some people, a once in a lifetime opportunity to really see the world in a new way. And I think it's important to allow passengers to interact and, and also for comfort reasons, to allow them to get up and walk around um, and, and experience the 360 degree views from all the windows uh, in, the, um, in the capsule. Now this is a layout of the, of the capsule, and you can see there's eight passengers that are on board, and there's two pilots. But there's still enough space for the passengers to get up and walk around. The two volumes you can see in the middle, the one on the left is a, a bar, a drinks bar, and the one on the right is, is a lavatory, because you're going to need that, um, you know, considering you're up there for six to eight hours. So the, the bar also acts as a, a storage volume to store an eight course tasting menu. And this is, um, we've designed this menu in a way that emphasizes and, and creates those kind of strong memories and links to the images you're seeing. So it's kind of uh, connecting the senses. Um, yeah, so I can't remember the question, sorry. Um. <laughs> So yeah, I mean, yeah. lots of really, really interesting design features on board. Um, I think the question I really want to ask is like, again, will this actually happen? Like, do you know what the timeline is for Worldview? When might we see these flights taking off? So Worldview, as I mentioned before, are taking, uh, taking uh, deposits. I think it's not a case of if it will happen. It's, yeah. a case, it's definitely going to happen. Space tourism is definitely going to happen. I think. The fundamentals of this project, um, I really stand behind the fundamentals of this project. It's, uh, it's a sustainable way of achieving um, space tourism and, and getting that, achieving that kind of perspective on Earth, the overview effect and, and getting everybody to really, really um, experience that. And also it's, um, again, before I mentioned, it's a more gentle ride, it's not a rocket. It's, it's accessible to a lot of people. So I think those two things combined play in the favor of, of worldview and really make space tourism much more of a reality than people currently see it. Mm. Um, and how do you engage potential customers um, or investors long before the experience is actually open to the public? So as I mentioned before, we've got an incredible visualization department. Um, so we're a multi multidisciplinary design studio. We're 70 people based in London. And we have everyone under one roof, so we can really control the narrative of our projects and produce the material that's needed at any particular time during the project to generate funding, to generate interest, and to uh, and, and often we create VR experiences that allow us to virtually try the experience before um, before it exists. We also build a lot of mock-ups and models and really uh, engage customers and and prospective um, companies at that level. That's interesting you mentioned VR because when I was looking at this um, image and imagining myself sitting by that window, I wondered whether I'd have a sense of vertigo because I am a little bit scared of heights. And I wonder whether have, being able to give people that opportunity to preview the experience with like a VR headset is actually quite 
important almost to uh, making uh, sure they're not going to panic when they're up there. <laughs> you know. Absolutely, we've yeah. actually got um, we've got a 360 degree um, walk through uh, uh, interactive um, experience, and I've I've got it with me if anybody wants to check it out after this oh, cool. after this talk. Yeah, and um, so where do you think if you were going to do one of these flights? Would firstly would you, and if so. Where would you want to do the ascent from? I think uh, it's a question of which one would I start at first. I okay, think I yeah. would like to definitely. I would definitely. I would definitely want to experience that um, the overview effect that astronauts talk about. I think it would just, yeah, it would be an absolutely incredible experience. Yeah, definitely. Um, and so coming back to Michael, we're running out of time, and if there are any questions at the end, we're really happy to take them. I'm just going to go to Michael then. I'd love to take your question, definitely. I'm sure there are quite a few of you with questions. So, um, Michael, I wanted to ask you, you know, is space tourism ready for liftoff? Um, what are your personal feelings about going into space? Um, no, uh, it's not. Uh, it's not there yet. It will get there. Um, and it'll be a very niche, very tiny market. But it'll be an amazing market, as you can see from Mike's presentation. Um, it, it'll be for very, very few folks um, for a considerable length of time, but it'll still be there. So um, one could maybe say, you know, safaris um, are available, but it's a very tiny market. Uh, people do it and they love it, um, but it's tiny compared with the overall tourism market. Uh, space tourism will take a little piece. Um, it'll be amazing, um, but it'll be very tiny. So um, it, it will take, you know, it will take some time. I often remember people say, how long have you been working on moon? And we say 23 years. And they, that's crazy. It couldn't possibly have taken that long. But I remember when we started in 2000, I remember Richard was starting Virgin um, at the same time. And he was going to be flying paying passengers by 2007. And that didn't happen with all of the resources. So it big projects take time, technology takes time, always takes longer than one anticipates. Nobody could foresee COVID. Uh, nobody could foresee uh, the financial crisis. And it goes on and on. So things take longer than, unfortunately, always longer than anticipated, but we are ready to go. I think Mike is ready to go. Uh, Blue Origin are started a little bit. Virgin have started a little bit. Um, uh, so it's, it's not there yet, but it will get there in the next five years. Um, but it'll be a very, very tiny, very spectacular, very interesting, very wow but very tiny market. Mm. Um, when will it become come mainstream? When Moon opens. When we're top billing at Arabian travel market, I think we will know that we'll space tourism. We'll not be the last, we'll be the first. <laughs> <laughs> and exactly. the hole will be not big enough. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Now, um, I would love to take uh, any questions from the floor. Um, there might be, a, I think, hopefully a microphone. If you want to share your, your name and, and where you're, you're from, that would be fantastic. Um, uh, we've got uh, somebody at the front here. Thank you, Greg. Rather than you shouting out. <laughs> Hello. Uh, my name is Eva from Fashion Studio Magazine from Canada. Uh, I have a question for Michael. Uh, your project is really fascinating, by the way. Congratulations. Thank you. Um, you showed us the outside uh, of, uh, of the project, how it's going to look like. I'm very curious about the interior design of the hotels, uh, because you mentioned that uh, the hotels are going to be something very different, something we haven't seen before. Uh, so if you could just describe a little bit uh, your vision, your idea of the interior design, uh, how the rooms are going to look like, if they are going to look more like um, I don't know, like a spaceship or like a regular hotel, you know, a bedroom, bathroom. So uh, if you could please uh, describe your vision for the interiors. Thank you. Did you Thank hear that? Do you want me to repeat? I, I, think, I think I got you it. Got Thank it. you for your question. The exterior is basically carbon fiber composite, so it will mimic the moon's surface, 
on the outside. Um, because it's so vast, um, it will look very realistic. We impregnate it with uh, solar panel systems so that the project is very environmentally friendly. It's a lead platinum building. Um, and uh, we, do have, um, mm, we do have some interesting uh, abilities for you to uh, uh, experience that exterior surface, which I can't talk about right now, but um, you'll, you'll actually be uh, able to experience some of that surface area. Uh, but it will be very realistic, um, and it's a bit of a jigsaw puzzle from an architectural perspective. Essentially, we, we create the actual moon um, surface and then we put it together with a jigsaw puzzle and it all comes together. Moon, moon as a building project will not look attractive until the very end. And then it'll blow your mind. But it'll essentially be cranes and concrete and everything else. It, it will look like, wow, what's this? This is not very interesting. Until the end, until the actual jigsaw puzzle comes together. And then it'll knock you off. Um, the actual interior design, it's a, it's a great question because people tend to immediately um, sort of default to the, is it going to look like Disney? Uh, is it going to look like, you know, a spaceship and so on? The answer is no. Uh, Moon is often talked about as a themed resort. It's actually not a themed resort at all. Yes, of course, on the outside, it's going to look like the moon. Um, on the lunar surface, of course, it's going to look like the moon. The lunar colony is going to look like the moon. Um, but apart from that, the rest of the interior design has no reference whatsoever to moon. None. Um, it's going to be very futuristic, uh, but not spacey, not moonish. Um, it's going, you know, our, our convention center, all of these component parts will look very different. Our health and wellness center will look different, but again, not spacey, not, we have, a, we have a name for Las Vegas, tacky. I don't know if that word translates here, but not tacky. Um, very high end, very high quality, um, best designers in the world, largest art collection in the world, um, but also uh, very um, contemporary is the word I'm looking for. So. Think about something that's contemporary. We call it our surprises. Every corner you turn, it's a surprise. But it's not a tacky uh, Las Vegas surprise. It's something much, much, much more authentic and different. Yes, you may have a restaurant inside uh, called Luna. It's possible. But um, you will not have people walking around uh, dressed with lightsabers and, <laughs> and whatever else. Um, so yeah, very, very different interior. We have great interior designers. Um, it's a showcase for them as well, obviously. Uh, but yeah, design is gonna be important. Um, our four pillars are architecture, uh, leading edge, engineering, design, and technology. Um, and we'll actually have a, uh, a tour, uh, what we call our, our backstage tour, where all of those disciplines, if you're an interior designer, you can actually come and we'll take you into the back of the building and show you how we put it together, how it actually works, how the PAR system and HVAC systems and how the whole thing comes together and works. So you'll be able to see everything, um, which is pretty cool. And big companies like Siemens and all of these big international companies will be involved. So. Yeah, it'll be, pretty, it'll be pretty interesting. You know, I'm not showing too many renderings because we don't want to give too much away. As we move forward, you're going to start to see a lot more, but not everything, because we want to make it a, a, a surprise. Great, any more questions from the floor? Okay, well, we've covered a lot in this session. Thank you so much for your attention. I know it's been a long day and a long week. Um, I hope you'll have a fantastic evening. Um, thank you very much. I think it's been, you know, really, really inspiring to hear from both these incredible panelists about what they're working on. Two very, very different projects, but both examples, I think, of how space tourism will be democratized in different ways. So thank you, Mike. Thank you, Michael. Cheers. Thanks,